morning, everybody. Are you on here? I can hear it on. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to Snohomish United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Drew Frisbee, and I am so happy to see you all here. Especially happy to see all of our uh, United Women in, in Faith folks who put on that amazing rummage sale yesterday. And to see you all upright and here and smiling, that is, uh, that is amazing. Yesterday, we had some pretty tired folks here at the end, and, uh, but you all did really good work. I'm, I, I hope you all give yourself a nice pat on the back, and uh, I, I understand, are we going to hear any totals from there, any uh, news about it? Do we, does somebody want to talk about it now? Not yet? You want to do it later? Okay. In the mission moment. Okay. So stay tuned for that. That's what they call a cliffhanger in the business. So we have a few announcements coming up here. Um, there was a, a mistake on the slide, and I apologize. There's a, there's a hike coming up on the 22nd. So if you're around on the 22nd, the time should be correct, but the date, it said the 17th, but that is obviously not, not correct. It is the 22nd. So hope you'll all join in for that. Next week, um, I'll be out of town for a bit of continuing education, and so you will get to, you all will get to meet uh, some very near and dear uh, guest preachers, uh, my folks are going to come up and, uh, and they're going to preach for me. So that should be a good fun time next week as well. Any other announcements for the good of the order here before we get going? Okay. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, usually we stand, for, I think, for the call to worship, but if you don't want to do that, I guess you don't have to because there's no little star there, so. <laughs> and you're probably recovering from yesterday anyway. So, <laughs> our loving God welcomes us to this place. As, As people, people of faith, faith we, we rejoice, rejoice in the, the holy, holy mystery, mystery of, of God's, God's welcome. welcome. In a world full of walls, jails, and division, Christ calls us to be proclaimers of freedom. Freedom, freedom for, for all, all not, not just, just for some. Them. Be ready, people of God. When we draw our circle wider, we start to catch a glimpse of God's kingdom. We're, We're ready, ready to, to be, be the bearers, bearers of, of God's, God's good, good news. news. Amen. Now it says we should stand up. <laughs> There'll be sunshine in the morning, and that's included on this little paper with your bulletin. Friends, this is going to be a, a new one for you, maybe, but uh, it's, it's pretty catchy. I think once we get going with this, you'll, you'll be able to sing along and We'll see what we can do here. There'll be sunshine in the morning. There'll be sunshine in the morning. There'll be sunshine.
to all God's children. Freedom to all God's children one of these days. Justice will flow like a mighty Actually, you can rise and share the peace of Christ with one another. Sorry about the calisthenics. A story for the kids. We are coming. All right, I've got your, I've got your chairs. Oh, good. You're bringing the panda. That's good. Hopefully, it doesn't count on anything. All right. All right. Okay. Oh, how are you guys doing? Uh, 
So, so. Good. How's, how's Panda? Panda's good? All right. So, today, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about, um, about welcoming people, right? And being kind and, and finding ways that we can, we can welcome people. And today we're going to talk about things that we do to sort of put up barriers between people and how, you know, do you guys ever, do you ever do this? Do you ever think like, oh, I want to, I want to talk to this person, but not this person. So you might be really friendly with one person, but then somebody else, you might be like kind of shut down and, and not talk as much to them. Do you ever do that? Well, there are barriers we put up between ourselves, sometimes. Anybody out there put up barriers between yourself and other people? There are big system barriers that we put up. As a society, as a country, we put them up. Wait. We, we put up barriers that divide us based on all sorts of things, age and gender and race and ethnicity, we put up all sorts of these barriers between us. But you know what? Part of our story today is about how we knock down some of those barriers that divide us. Okay? So, so I've got here a little wall, and Ellis, I need you to be gentle. You're a lot bigger than Loan. And I don't want you guys to, to cause a big fuss here. Why don't you guys come around the other side? Come around the other side here. And I want you guys, on the count of three, I, got, I want you guys to bust through this wall. All right, can we all count to three? Can we all count to three? One, two, three. Oh, oh that was really dangerous, Ellis. All right, all right, let's, let's build it back up and let Lowen do it. That was, that was scary. I was worried you were going to knock your head into that. Yeah. Okay. All right. But, you know, so when we put up those barriers, we don't get to see people for who they are. But when you, can you knock through this barrier alone? If you knock through this barrier, you knock it down. Whoa, you knocked it down. When you do that, then you get to see the person on the other side for who they really are, right? You see them as a beloved child of God instead of somebody that you should be afraid of, okay? So we're going to hear a story today, and it's going to be kind of dramatic. You're going to hear a story about people who are in jail. Anybody out there know anybody in jail? Sometimes? Maybe. And in this particular case, God causes an earthquake and opens all the doors to the jail and breaks the chains. And so you'll get to hear how that story goes today. Okay? So this is a story about, about a couple of um, people in the early church who who were trying to share the good news about Jesus, and they were put in jail. And if you guys want, you can take these blocks to the back of the sanctuary, and uh, can, you, can you help carry these back there? And you guys can keep playing with them. Just don't, don't hurt yourself with them, okay? Okay. All right. All right, Loan, you carry your panda. Maybe I'll hand these two to... Here. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming up.
That was exciting. My. <laughs> Today's scripture reading is Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 34, and this is about Paul and Silas. <clears throat> One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. <clears throat> About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. <clears throat> they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O oh God of liberation, of freedom, we come to you today as a, a people who are seeking to hear your good word in our hearts. Not so that we will continue just to be comfortable in our place in this world, but so that we could be made uncomfortable with injustice so that we might hear your good word on our hearts, all of these meditations, all of those things that race through our brains. Oh God, we pray that in this time, in this space, we could set all of that aside, 
be present here with one another and with you. Pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our rock, our redeemer, and our friend. Amen. Well, friends, this morning, uh, or this summer, rather, we've, we've been talking a lot about this practice of radical hospitality, this Christian ethic. We've talked a lot about how God's inclusive nature calls on us to widen our circle of caring, to think about how we welcome those who are of different ages, how we welcome the LGBTQI community, how we welcome those who are differently abled. And today we're, we're going to talk a little bit about hospitality in a different way. We have barriers that we put up between us. Now, some of them are not maybe as concrete as the, the foam blocks that the kids were knocking down a little bit ago. Some of these barriers we can't see. Some of these barriers, these injustices that folks face in our world today are things that are very real, affect our lives, affect all of our lives. But you can't see it. You can't see what somebody is facing just by looking at them. Now some of these more obvious barriers that we put up are, you know, like the, the wall on the southern border. But some of them are also mental or cultural or spiritual barriers that prevent us from extending our full welcome to another human being. And that full welcome could just be how you interact with somebody on a person-to-person -person basis. Or it could be how you see an entire group of people based on subconscious bias. We all have it. In the early days of Methodism, way back in the 1700s, John and Charles Wesley were, were students at Oxford University. And they decided to, to, store, to form a little study group, a prayer group that they called the Holy Club. And as you can imagine, a group of students calling themselves the Holy Club might not be all that popular among the other students. In the early days of the club, they focused mainly on personal piety. But there was a member of the Holy Club named William Morgan, who encouraged John and the others to get out of their comfort zones and connect those spiritual learnings with and those Bible studies, and those fasting sessions, and get them out into the world to go and live the gospel by visiting those who were, who were poor and those who were in prison. This became a weekly routine. And this, so this was part of our heritage, that Methodism would not be the movement it is today without the Holy Club and William Morgan encouraging John to go and do prison ministry. It planted the seeds for social justice and is probably why we have a social creed in the United Methodist Church. <clears throat> this, is, this is sort of how Methodism became known in the early days. This early Holy Club was derided by other people, other groups. They wrote <clears throat> pamphlets and other things about this club, talking about how they were so extreme. And they called them Methodists because of how methodical they were in their prayer and their study and their discipline and their ministry with the poor and imprisoned. Years after this, in 1739, John Wesley would purchase an old cannon foundry. And he began to use this space where a cannon had exploded and damaged the building and had been left vacant for many years. He used that building as his base of operations for the new Methodist movement in England. It served many purposes, and among them, it was a place not just where people could come and learn or worship, 
but it was a place where his fellow Methodists could organize and offer a prison ministry. In those days, you could end up in prison for all sorts of reasons. John's own dad was in and out of debtor's prison. <clears throat> if you were too poor to pay your debts, that's where you'd end up. If you, picked up, if you were picked up as vagrant or just <clears throat> any number of reasons, you'd end up in prison without a due process, without a lawyer, without any sort of advocate for you. In fact, there weren't even really meals served in the prisons back in those days. So if you ended up in prison and you didn't have a family on the outside bringing you food, how are you going to eat? How are you going to get medicine if you got sick? So that ministry of those early Methodists offered out of that old cannon foundry, a, a factory of war turned into a factory of peace. It served to allow them to bring meals into the old prison there. And John Wesley would, would often say later that, that there is no personal holiness without social holiness. He connected those two. He didn't say that one was more important than the other, but that one would lead to the other, whichever one you start with. So for him, the personal piety and all the personal piety in the world really didn't mean much unless you used your life to impact the world around you and try to make things better. So it's interesting that this is part of our church's origin story. This connection between personal piety and social holiness, it's an important one for us in 2024 as Methodists. If you look in our hymnals, you can see it written in the songs that we sing. You can see it in our Book of Discipline. You can see it in the Book of Resolutions. You can see it all over Methodist doctrine that we are a people who historically have connected our faith with action and advocacy. Because you see, hospitality is more than just inviting people into our space and making them feel loved when they come here. It's also about going out there and helping to create the kind of world and society where people are cared for where they are, wherever they are, whether they're in prison, or in a memory care unit, or homebound. <clears throat> in ways that don't require them to agree with you or worship like you. This is important because as we think about this story that we heard today from Acts chapter 16, we really can't gloss over the fact that Paul and Silas ended up in prison a lot. These guys were regular. In this case, they were thrown in jail because they were, quote-unquote, disturbing the peace. Now, whose peace were they disturbing? Reminds me a little bit of uh, the late civil rights icon and congressman John Lewis. He just got a new statue put up this week. Um, it reminds me a little bit of, of what he would often talk about about the necessity of getting into good trouble. Well, Paul and Silas, they were getting into some good trouble here. And as they enter into this city, this unnamed slave girl who tells fortunes by a spirit of divination starts following them around. So we're told that she's using this affliction because this is this is really an affliction that she has. This is not a gift that she has. We're told that she's using this to make quite a bit of money for her masters because she is a slave. Now, what she says about Paul and Silas isn't exactly untrue. She says, these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Interesting that she uses that word slaves, knowing that that's her reality. In freeing this girl from oppression, whether it was through 
sheer annoyance or whether it was a thought out, structured moment of ministry or whether it was knocking down the barriers for that woman, whatever it was, Paul in that action upends the order of things in the city. The powers that be in the city see these two cultural and religious outsiders as subverting the status quo as they break the chains of oppression in front of everybody. Everybody sees them do this. Everybody knows who the masters are. Everybody knows who pulls the strings, who's in charge in that city. And so it's easy to see why the powers that be would want to toss Paul and Silas into jail. But even as we see the very walls of that jail open wide, the very foundation of the jail is shaken to its core and all of the chains are busted open, we're left wondering, who was truly imprisoned here? Those in power have the ability to commit these violent acts against folks who healed a person. But the people who are working there, the jailer, those who are in the city, the slave girl, they're being manipulated the whole time by those slave owners behind the scenes. And then at the end of the day, in the section, if you were to read after this, when Paul reveals that he and Silas are actually Roman citizens, there's fear that's shown on the magistrate's face that de demonstrates another level of oppression that you don't even see at the beginning of the story. The Roman occupation is that weight that they all feel. So who exactly is free and who exactly is imprisoned here? When we knock down the walls that divide us, we offer glory to God. When those physical walls came crashing down and the systems of oppression that propped up that economic system that was unjust, that propped up this system, was shaken to the core, the jailer was ready to take his own life. He didn't, want, he didn't want to cross those powers on his own. He was worried that he would be subjected to that same level of imprisonment and treatment that Paul and Silas had already undergone at his hands. Was death somehow better than that treatment? Who knows? Maybe it was. But then Paul again upends the order of things. As he and the other prisoners are still there. Because they were never prisoners to begin with. They were there singing hymns. In their minds, they knew that God would set them free. Paul extends God's grace and God's welcome even to that person who had just flogged him and imprisoned him. And he turns around and offers kindness in response. There's a lesson there for us in the United States with friends and neighbors and family members who are at odds over a political year that seems like it's not ending anytime soon even though we, we know that this ends in November, but does it ever really end? Paul turns around and offers kindness, even to the person who has wronged him. Seeing him no longer as an enemy, but as a beloved child of God, because he's torn down the barriers that are between them. He's torn down this system of injustice, and shown that it is what it is, that it is a manufactured thing in that city. And seeing the jailer as a person of, 
of worth is powerful. That he's worthy of salvation is powerful. If this person can be saved, then who among us can truly say that there is anybody here who is unredeemable? It's amazing to show that kind of hospitality to the jailer and his family, who then turn the tables and offer hospitality to Paul and Silas, and maybe the other prisoners too. They end up washing their wounds that they inflicted. They end up feeding them in the middle of the night a full meal. And then Paul baptizes them. That welcome goes both ways. The walls we put up around ourselves are not impossible to break down. It takes intention, and maybe sometimes some methodical planning and organizing. But it's very possible and very necessary work. There was a, <clears throat> there was a note that came across my desk last week that reminded me of an organization uh, here in Washington State that I've worked with before at one of my previous churches. Uh, the organization is called One Prisoner, or One Parish, One Prisoner. Anybody familiar with that? It, they started up in Skagit Valley, uh, where my previous churches were, and they do transformative work with local churches, pairing them with somebody who's incarcerated. <clears throat> so this organization focuses on that connecting piece. They'll train a local group from a local church who are willing to make this you know, several year commitment to walk by this person who's incarcerated, who's working their way towards getting out. And you know, if you know anything about our prison system, just how high the rates are for people to re-offend and end up right back in prison. Because if you think about it, if that's all you know, your friends are in jail. Your friends have been in and out of jail. Those are the people you hang out with when you get out. How are you going to break out of that? How are you going to break those barriers down? And so this is what this organization helps churches to do for individuals. It was Bayview United Methodist Church, a very small congregation that was where I got to see the impact of this. We got to help a young man use his faith to make positive changes in his life that have so far kept him out of prison, kept him from going back to prison. And it's been said in Washington State that there are roughly the same number of churches as there are incarcerated individuals. So the vision there for One Parish, One Prisoner is to say, why couldn't we partner them together and have everybody have a built-in community when they get out. Because that community is what keeps people from going back in. I don't know if this is something that we here in Snohomish would like to take on, but I think it's something that we ought to at least think about. We ought to explore what that would look like. It's a powerful program for both the imprisoned individuals and for the parish that lifts them up. Even if this is not something that we end up doing here, we need to think about how we as a community of faith are working to break down the walls that we put up between us. And those, between us and those that Jesus called the least of these. Systemic injustices are the hardest barriers to break down. Because they stem from propping up power the powers that be that, that profit off of injustice and the status quo. Those are the hardest barriers to break down. And so for us to use our faith to affect those sorts of injustices in society, we're often going to be taken solidly out of our comfort zones. But Jesus never said that following him would be easy. What he said was, take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say that would be easy. But that's exactly where God is calling us. 
to find ways to move ourselves out of our comfort zone, to go where those who are afflicted by these injustices are, to extend God's grace, God's love, and God's welcome to people and places where we least expect to see that kind of grace. May it be so. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, you can remain seated as we sing our next song. We're going to sing, Christ Has Broken Down the Wall. Uh, this is in your green hymnal, which is fairly new. You may have noticed that this is here now, uh, the mysterious green book. It'll get less mysterious as we go along. And so you can find this on 3122 or up on the screen. <clears throat> in the church is the responsibility of Christians in managing and using wisely the gifts that God has given us. These gifts include not only financial and physical resources, but also time, relationship, worship, thanksgiving, prayer, and service. Stewardship is a way of living that expresses gratitude to God and shares these gifts in love of God and neighbor. We see that in our church through their many efforts, maintaining our church and property, community kitchen, Salton Ministries, God's Garden, multi-denominational vacation Bible school, missional projects, and our giving throughout the year. Our latest effort yesterday was our rummage sale. We used our resources and brought together items that others can use through a donation, and that money goes on to support missions, and United Women of Faith. 
And I have here, which I haven't looked at yet because I wanted to be surprised with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thanks to all of you, we made $1,715 yesterday. Yay. Thank you so, so much. So that was a good day yesterday. I just like the fellowship of it too. You can work hard and you can get your back sore and your legs sore, but you know what? The fellowship to me is just the best. So as our own households have monthly obligations, so does our church, and we are our church's stewards. So as we enter into fall, the finance committee, which I'm the chair of, will be meeting to plan a stewardship campaign for the next year, which helps with our budgeting. But before that, we have to finish out this year financially. It has been the finance committee's goal to keep a three-month operating cash reserve in the bank. So as I put out in recent updates, we have been at the point where we're dipping a little bit into those reserves, and some are typically trends that way. Financial giving is maybe down a little bit with people on vacation, but it's our responsibility as the Finance Committee to keep you updated on that. So what I would ask you today and in the weeks ahead is please prayerfully consider any extra giving, and this goes toward the works of our church, and keep our church in your prayers. Thank you. Ushers, please come forward. justice and mercy. 
The temptation is strong to make our gifts to you on Sunday feel as if we've done all that is expected, then wake up on Monday and live like all the rest of the world. Deep in our souls, we know that's not what Christ calls us to do. But the safe road is so much easier. God of compassion, embolden us to be involved in some good trouble. Embolden us to stand out against the backdrop of a world that says, take care of your own. Embolden us to use our voices to speak out on behalf of the voiceless. To use our ears to hear the discouraged and defeated. And use our arms to help the weak and powerless. We pray all of this in the name of the one who conquered death. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, I have not uh, received any uh, of the paper slips and any um, joys or concerns this morning. Yes, you've got one? Oh, welcome. Welcome. And so for those of you on the live stream, we've got visitors from, from Texas. And welcome. We're glad you're here. Any other joys or concerns today? Let us pray. Let's oh, sing. We're going to sing first. All right. Father, we pray today, O oh God, for all of our beloved friends who are not here with us in this physical space, for all of our, our homebound friends, for those who are imprisoned, for those who feel imprisoned in all the different ways that people can feel imprisoned. Oh God, we pray today for the barriers to come down. For the walls we put up between us to be broken down. We pray for, for safe travels for our, our friends from Texas. For safe travels for Julia as she travels to and from Yakima for the Faith Foundation this week. for all of the war-torn places in this world that we know need your healing touch. Oh God, we pray that the barriers between us and a peaceful world would come down. In places like Ukraine and Gaza and Sudan. You know, God, we pray for We pray for health and food to be delivered in these places as well. We know that far too many of your beloved children are starving, are not getting nourishment. It hurts our heart, oh God. For this community here in Snohomish, in all of our surrounding communities. We pray for health. We pray for wholeness. We pray for all those who would never walk into this building, but are yearning to feel loved and cared for by a community. We pray that they would find that, either with us or with another group. We pray that we could be your hands and feet right here in this town. We pray all of this in the name 
of your Son, Jesus Christ, our rock, our redeemer, and our friend. And friends, we are bold as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Him, Stand By Me, number 512, in our, in our hymnal here. And if you notice that the scripture, the, uh, the story about Paul and Silas is mentioned in this, in this story, in this hymn here, written by our uh, historic gospel writer, uh, Al, uh, Charles Tindley. <laughs> for being here. Thank you for being a church family. Now receive this benediction. Go forth to break down those barriers between you and your neighbor. Go forth as beloved children of God. Amen. Go in peace, friends. Amen.